democracynow, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the epicenter of the pandemic, New York City. And we're continuing our conversation with Dr. Armin Henderson, an African-American doctor in Miami, Florida, who we first spoke with last week, shortly after he was handcuffed outside his home while preparing for a volunteer shift to help protect homeless people from the spread of COVID-19. Surveillance video from Dr. Henderson's house shows him wearing a mask and loading a van with supplies when a Miami police patrol car pulls up outside his home. Moments later, the police officer has the doctor in handcuffs. Dr. Henderson says the officer detained him after accusing him of littering and demanding his identification, which Henderson did not have on him. The officer was not wearing a mask or gloves, and Dr. Henderson told us, quote, I could feel his saliva on my lips. Dr. Henderson had to yell to his wife inside their home to bring out identification before he was released by the officer, who has not been publicly identified. Dr. Henderson told Democracy Now! the officer has a history of use of force and civilian complaints. The Miami police chief has since ordered an internal investigation into the incident. Since we spoke with Dr. Henderson last Wednesday, Miami's police chief Jorge Colina has tested positive for COVID-19 and is in self-isolation. Dr. Henderson has taken a test himself and is waiting for results and accountability. The encounter has sparked widespread outrage and comes as African-American men report fears of increased racial profiling when they're following the CDC suggestion that people wear masks in public. What if you wear a mask while black? Dr. Armin Henderson is an internal medicine physician and assistant professor of medicine at University of Miami, organizer with Dream Defenders. In part two of our conversation that we continue right now, I asked him to describe his encounter with the police as the officer arrested him in front of his house. Yes, yeah, he said I should call him sir or sergeant when I'm talking to him. Um, and when my wife came out and actually said, why, are you, why do you have my husband in handcuffs? Uh, the officer basically said, well, because he has an attitude with me. And I was just like, oh, okay. Um, and, and in my head, I said that. And, you know, my wife basically was able to say, okay, well, I can get my ID. She got it. And he basically let me go. Have you heard of other African-Americans being harassed by police officers uh, with, with the um, African-Americans wearing masks? Do you think the mask was part of his um, reason why he attacked you? What was part of the reason why he uh, detained you and handcuffed you? Uh, potentially. I, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't really know what his motives are. Um, as, I, as I stated um, earlier, you know, and it, it's it's apparent on the on the video is that he rode down the street very very slow, um, and then turned back around to turn down my street uh, to approach me. Um, so it could have been the mass, it could have been the fact that that I was black, it could have been both. Um, and so I, I know for a fact that it likely was not due to the fact that I was that he said I was you know littering. Yeah. Tell us again. Um, tell us again. We're looking at the video as you're speaking. Um, right. And uh, he slowly comes up. He gets out of his car. And right. what did he say to you? He he basically, well, it, it, first of all, in the car, you know, he, he basically was was trying to figure out or, or asking me where what I was doing there. What, why why was I here? You know, and I, I live in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood. Uh, my family is probably, well, it is the only uh, black family that lives uh, on the block. Um, so, you know, it, I, I think that that, you know, it, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, he, he just, he was saying a lot, and it, it was, his body language was, was just very aggressive. Um, and when he got out of the car, I was more focused on trying to de-escalate the situation, um, trying to, to walk away. Um, and, and gather myself so that, you know, I wouldn't respond in a different way than I actually did. When he took you and uh, handcuffed you, um, he's not wearing gloves, he's not wearing a mask, uh, you had a mask on. Did you say anything to him about him uh, speaking in your face and keeping some distance? No, I didn't. I mean, at that point, you know, he, he already escalated to a point, I mean, I was already in handcuffs. You know, so what what more can I say at that point? I was just focusing on keeping my mouth shut and hoping that my wife would come out like as soon as possible. So 
what do you understand has happened to him at this point? It's now um, a few days later, like five days later. Um, what is the Miami police chief doing? Have you been formally apologized to, and what are you demanding? So the, the Miami Police Department has not called me uh, to, to apologize. Um, I do think that he should be held accountable for his actions. Um, he, he violated a bunch of protocols, uh, not only as a sergeant, but also as a police officer. I think that they're supposed to be wearing, you know, bracelets that say that they've been tested. Fire that irresponsible person. Um, you know, he probably should not have stopped me in the first place. Um, so I just, I just want him held accountable for his actions, um, and, and, I, and I want an apology as well. Dr. Armin Henderson, now let's talk about what you were doing at that van, what you were loading in and out of the van. I want to talk about your work with unhoused people. You're a physician. Right. You're an assistant professor of medicine at University of Miami. Uh, talk about the homeless population in Miami. Right. So, um, so the homeless population in Miami is... Uh, it's, it's a large population, and um, basically because we live in Miami and we are at the helm of climate change, uh, we have a crisis situation every year uh, during hurricane season, uh, which is June through November. And so, you know, what we've seen in the past is that not only just with homeless people, but also with vulnerable populations, those who, who are working class, uh, low income, live in poverty, and particularly in the black neighborhoods throughout Miami-Dade County, um, we've seen that there's a disparate response when it comes to crisis situations um, in, uh, during, uh, like during hurricane season. And so during Hurricane Irma, we found that you know, FEMA and the government were saying one thing on TV, but in reality, people on the ground weren't being fed, they weren't getting water, uh, their electricity was taking weeks to come back on, and people who depended on these things to actually live, oxygen and you know, uh, dialysis, were not getting the things that they needed. And so it really took a coalition of organizations to step in and actually be, um, and actually, you know, to, to, to take the place of, or, or to, to step in where the government was not. And so usually we, um, we activate during uh, hurricane season, but during the pandemic, uh, we actually decided to activate as well. And during this time, we actually decided to focus on unhoused people um, because we know that when you're asking people to shelter in place, Houseless people have, they have, they, they can't put tents outside uh, because police are harassing them. So not only are police harassing me outside of my house, but they're also harassing homeless people. They don't allow them to put up tents. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're, we're not allowed to feed uh, homeless people on the street, et cetera. Um, so we've been going out as an act of civil uh, disobedience um, to feed the homeless, to provide them with socks and, and, and toiletries and sanitizer and masks. Because during a public health crisis like this, um, the homeless population should be the population that you pay the most attention to. Um, and the county organizations that are supposed to protect and provide for these organizations just are not doing enough um, so, and much of anything at all. You can say it. They failed. Um, people who are, don't have houses, their access to water, the first thing we know, the best prevention is washing your hands repeatedly. Right. Yeah, so, you know... You, you would think that in America, everybody has access to, to clean water. Um, but what we're going to show, basically, when we go down there on Friday, and I'm going to have other media there um, at a press conference, we're going to talk to individuals who live on the street um, about the types of um, the types of things that they're facing uh, during this pandemic, particularly uh, having to use uh, the restroom outside, uh, not being able to wash their hands, um, now, the county and the city has provided a wash station for 200 individuals, but when you go to that wash station, the water smells like sewage. You know, the porta potties, the, the two porta potties they provided for 300 individuals living in downtown Miami had poop all the way up to the, uh, the, the, the toilet seat, you know? And it's just like, what, what conditions are you subjecting people to live in um, in, in, in America who, who are citizens um, and are, who are humans, honestly? Um, and so we we've, we've really uh, are, have, have been trying to, to figure out the best way to put pressure on the city and the county and elected officials um, that get paid to actually take care of this population um, and, and also to test them to show that, that the virus is, is, um, is present in this population as well 
And this is also a population that's going to cycle throughout the jails, um, you know, because the police are still harassing people. They're still, you know, they're still locking people up and putting them in jails. Um, and so these are also people who are going to cycle in and out of shelters. I, I don't know if you saw in San Francisco, the entire shelter had to evacuate because some of the people who were sheltered there basically had coronavirus. They had an outbreak like, like that. Um, and so, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this whole thing unfolds, um, knowing the, the city and the county's relationship with, with jails, uh, knowing the police, uh, police is tenuous relationship with, with houseless people and the fact that they are allowed, it's like a federal, a federal mandate that they are allowed to, to break down people's tents um, and to, to arrest them on the street um, based on a, a federal ruling uh, that basically was overturned in 2018. Dr. Henderson, can you talk about the response of people who don't have houses when you go up to them to say you'd like to test them? And what are the kinds of tests that you're using? So um, we, uh, in, in the beginning, we were using uh, the nasal swab, uh, which is the PCR test, um, and individuals want to be tested, you know. Um, a lot of people who live uh, on the, the streets uh, in unsheltered um, uh, facilities in Miami-Dade County, they have symptoms, you know, and, uh, and of course, it could be attributed to other things because they, they are in, in a very uh, harsh, they do live in a harsh environment. Um, but on the same token, they, they know that a pandemic is going on and, and they want to be attended to just like everyone else. Um, and so, you know, we, we've just been trying to figure out the best way to go about uh, testing them. Um, but they, they've been very amenable to the testing, you know. Um, they, uh, they basically, you know, want them, they want to be tested and, and they're, they're open to it. And people have walked up to me and said, you know what, I want to be tested. The problem is that the tests take too long to come back. And that's why starting this week, we're actually going ahead uh, with another test that's going to be rapid. It's going to give them the results in 15 minutes. Um, and we're, we're rolling out that test actually starting today. And, and Dr. Henderson, how did you get involved with Dream Defenders and doing this kind of work? Yeah, so, you know. Ironically, Dream Defenders was started in 2012 after uh, the death of Trayvon Martin and individuals throughout Miami-Dade County and, and also, you know, Tallahassee, most of them at FAMU, basically took over the courthouse um, and stayed there for 30 days until charges were brought against the person who killed Trayvon Martin. Um, and so I was seeing this unfold while I was in, uh, in, in medical school, feeling like, look, like, I, I chose the wrong profession, like... And, and I wanted to be involved, I just didn't know how. And so when I found out that I matched in Miami, Florida, in which Dream Defenders is based, um, I got involved with them as soon as I basically touched down off of the airplane. Um, and since then, you know, I've been uh, involved in a bunch of campaigns. Uh, most recently, we sued the, the, uh, the county over the, the jail facilities um, and, uh, and the, the, the amount of um, people that are housed at, at this one particular jail in Miami-Dade County. Um, but I've been involved in a number of campaigns throughout uh, my time with Dream Defenders, and it's been very enlightening and also refreshing to know that there are young people um, out there that actually care about um, humans in general, um, about poverty, about fighting capitalism, et cetera. And so um, recently, you know, we, we've been involved with homeless people, but we're, we're, uh, we're in the process of, of trying to start a trauma recovery center. Uh, particularly around um, violence that happens in, uh, in Liberty City um, and Miami-Dade County in general. Um, and so, yeah, we've been involved in a bunch of campaigns, and um, it's, been, it's been great working with the young people at Dream Defenders, for sure. I wanted to ask you about Fisher Island. That's not far from where you are in oh, Miami, yeah. the richest yeah. zip code that has bought coronavirus antibody tests for the yeah. entire island population, for all its millionaire residents. Average income, I think, two and a half million. Um, the, making the antibody, uh, uh, the antibody exams are available to all the 800 families, even though less than 1% of Florida has been tested. Now, these are antibody tests. I think the average age is over 60 there. Um, uh, a number of well-known um, corporate executives, um, everyone from uh, Oprah, to the head of Hasbro um, has had places there. Um, uh, 
what are some of the figures? It takes a, you have to pay a club membership of a quarter of a million dollars, average income two and a half million. Um, you can get there by helicopter or by boat. Explain this island. Now, you're an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Miami, and the island said that they are working with the University of Miami in getting these antibody tests out to everyone, even though it's extremely difficult to get the tests anywhere else. Yeah, um, well, I first want to talk to about the fact that Overtown, um, you know, basically uh, the disparity in Overtown and Fisher Island is so great that literally the life expectancy of people who live in Overtown is 15 years less or more in comparison to people live, that live on Fisher Island. Um, and so I'm going to serve people that actually live in Overtown, which is a predominantly you know, African-American uh, neighborhood. Um, and it, it just speaks to the fact that in Overtown is the most vulnerable population. And, you know, and yet these people who live on Fisher Island, which is literally like two miles away, um, can get access to these, to these tests knowing that the people that live in Overtown, their lives may depend on um, whether or not they, they, uh, they're able to identify if they have the virus and their access to care. Um, and so it, it just speaks to the hypocrisy of the system in general, um, that if, if, you, if you can pay enough money uh, to, to get access to, to things, and it, be it anything, um, then, then you get it. And if you don't, then you just don't, don't get it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, University of Miami is probably working with them. They're also, uh, I guess, the same people that they uh, obtain those those tests from um, are the same individuals that I'm trying to obtain the test from as well to test uh, homeless individuals. Now um, we're so talking guess, the antibody test, not the test to see whether you're COVID-19 positive now, right? Yeah, the, well, if, if we're speaking about the same rapid uh, test that you get within 15 minutes, then... then I don't think that, it's that. I think it's the actual antigen test to see if you've had it, the one that is much more difficult uh, to get. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably a way more expensive test. Um, the tests that we even have access to are the swabs, uh, which mm -hmm. take uh, four to ten days to get the results back. And as of today, basically, we're rolling out another test where, you know, it's within 15 minutes. It's a blood test. Um, but yeah, even with that one, right, it's, it's a blood test. Yeah, that says you know throughout you know your entire you know uh, throughout the entire time you know that you're alive, have you developed antibodies to this specific uh, virus? Um, so yeah, I mean that that's that's interesting, um, and it, it speaks to the disparities that exist um, within every system, but particularly within medicine, um, and it, it's part of the reason why you know people who live in Overtown because of, uh, of, their, of their income, because of their socioeconomic status, uh, that they basically um, don't get access to similar things. Um, but it also speaks to the history as well. Um, you know, it, it's not just because African Americans have diabetes or, or they, just don't, they just don't make enough. It's literally, you know, government, uh, local city and state governments that have come together to basically um, pass laws that make places inhabitable in general. Um, so particularly in Overtown, you know, it was a burgeoning black community, like the Harlem of the South, the most millionaires live there in Florida. And so the government decided to build 95, I-95 directly through the neighborhood. Um, and no one, to, to get to Miami Beach, and no one who was driving from, you know, upstate Florida to, Mi to Miami Beach could even visit those businesses. And so they all lost revenue, they closed down, people moved out. And the result that you have is, you know, people who have drug addiction, people who have serious mental illnesses, and those that live in poverty. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to talk about the history of it as well. Find any shelter at home uh, as, as spring break was unfolding and we were looking at the pictures of the thousands of people crowded on the beaches. Now he has said that worldwide wet wrestling is an essential act um, and has opened up worldwide wrestling uh, to, um, uh, to continue in Florida, uh, has been a fierce defender of President Trump. Can you talk about both responses and what it means for the people of Overtown and, and for you as a doctor? Right. I mean, so the people that we see actually um, succumbing to the virus and having the, the worst morbidity and mortality are those that are poor, 
that are homeless, that are working class, those that live on the transit, that run the transit systems, um, those that are in, you know, in uh, supermarkets, etc. Um, so when when you say when when President Trump or uh, Ron DeSantis, they're basically the same person. When when they say these things that they're going to open up the city and continue as business as usual, then what you're saying is that you really don't care about you know the the uh, the poor people, the working class individuals. You don't care about their health. Um, and so you know, honestly, I, I was I was one uh, early on. Um, you know, in in the in the community emergency uh, emergency center, a community emergency operations center that we run. Um, in the coalition of organizations, we have an epidemiologist uh, who works with us um, and, and also a public health expert who follows the numbers, particularly for uh, Florida and Miami-Dade County. And so early on, we were seeing that not only were the number of cases low, uh, but also the number of deaths were low as well. Um, and, you know, people have speculated about a number of reasons of that, why that is. But the reality is, is that it actually benefits um, the, the, our, our governor because he's saying, oh, look at our low numbers. Like, yeah, we have a bunch of cases, but our deaths are low. And so they, they use that to justify opening up economies uh, earlier, um, knowing that individuals are, are, are dying at a higher rate than, than what's been seen. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's just a complete disregard for, for poor and working class people, particularly those who are African Americans in places like Overtown, Liberty City, um, but also all across Florida. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's politics as usual for, for our governor, um, and he's, he's going to pair whatever Donald, Donald Trump says, um, and, and I can go on record saying that because even before uh, DeSantis was even chosen uh, as our governor, you know, I, I, was, I was one that to say that it's obvious that he's not going to care about poor people. I mean, this is a guy who, who had a commercial with his kids building a wall as, a, as, a, um, as advertisement for his governorship. You know, Disgusting. Build that wall. And, and of course, people thought it was funny, but it's like, wow, like this, this is the time that we're living in. And, and he's fulfilled every, every promise around making sure that people knew that he was Trump Jr. Dr. Armin Henderson, African-American doctor in Miami, Florida, who was handcuffed outside his home while preparing for a volunteer shift to help protect...